All right, good afternoon and welcome to Worcester Public Library's monthly nutrition class. These classes and our monthly cooking classes are funded with federal funds from the National Library of Medicine and National Institutes of Health through the University of Massachusetts, Worcester. Today, we welcome back registered dietitian Judy Palkin for her class, So Many Diets. Thank you, Judy. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, I'm happy to be here. I am speaking to you from Northborough. And at this moment, I'm just gonna share my screen because I have some slides to show you. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. So I'm really glad that everybody's here um, for the topic of so many diets. I have chosen this as a topic because a lot of people feel desperate to lose weight or make changes in how they eat, you know, to feel better for one reason or another. So um, I have a couple figures, something like 45 million Americans go on a diet each year and Americans spend something like $33 billion on diets each year. All right, and that includes weight loss products and diet books and programs and all the supplements that tend to go with them. It's a lot of money and it's a lot of people identifying themselves as going on diets. And these figures are from Boston Medical Center's website. So there's no shortage of people who are willing to jump in and meet the demand for these, for these diets. Some of them are qualified and many of them are not. Some create diets and regimens that are really good and reasonable and science-based and some do not. So let's take a look. This is what I wanna talk about in the time we have. I wanna spend most of the time talking about some popular diets. Many of these you'll probably have heard of and maybe you've wondered about them. And then at the end, I briefly wanna discuss just why there are so many, questions you should ask if you're thinking about going on one of these programs, some of the benefits of these diets, cause they're not all bad, some of them, and show you some diet art. And that last one is a bit of a joke. There really isn't diet art that I'm aware of, but of course I wanna show you some paintings that I hope will enhance our discussion of these diets and make it more fun. So first I'm just gonna show you this. This you've all probably seen in some version or other. It's from our government. It's the USDA image of kind of the proportions we should strive for when we eat with getting a lot of fruits and vegetables and smaller amounts of grains or high carb foods and protein. And for many people also dairy. So this is actually good advice. It's sensible advice and it's the starting off point for a lot of really good nutrition discussions. And I use it in a lot of my classes. But I think that part of the reason that there's so many diets out there is that people don't find this advice to be enough. They want something more. They want something exciting. Um, but is uh, my plate really that bad? Contrast that with this. This is a Van Gogh painting from 1885. And if you look closely, this is a, a family that has one food item. They have potatoes, it's called the potato eaters. And they also have tea. And I suspect that this scenario wasn't so unusual. And maybe even today in some places isn't so unusual that poor, worn down working people might only have one item of food to eat. So to these people, my plate would look really good, wouldn't it? Okay, so about the popular diets. There are so many of them out there. No one can keep track of them all. I don't know them all. Um, if you go to a bookstore like a Barnes and Noble, you'll, you might see an entire aisle devoted to diet books. If you go to Amazon, you'll find probably hundreds if not thousands of them. Um, sometimes I only hear about them from people like you, like someone will mention something to me and I'll say, oh, I've never heard of that. And in fact, one of the diets I'm going to talk about today in a few minutes, I had never heard of until a few weeks ago, someone told me about it and she raved about it and I'll tell you about it and what I really think of it. But there are some common threads to a lot of the diets that are out there. And here's what I think, what I know. 
a lot of them are overly restrictive. They restrict foods that don't need to be restricted. A lot of them have arbitrary rules. And by arbitrary rules, I mean rules that aren't based in any evidence or science. They're just rules that, I don't know, maybe make the diet interesting for people. And as an example, I'm gonna show you when I talk about Tom Brady's diet plan, he's got some arbitrary rules. And you know, I've wondered why, why do they put these arbitrary rules into the diets? And I think part of it is they want to stand out in a crowded field. So it's like a hook to grab you. Don't drink water with your meals. And you know, it's something to do or not do, as the case may be. And the other thing that I think goes on is that the people developing and promoting these diets sometimes genuinely believe this stuff, these arbitrary rules. They've been sold a bill of goods and they believe it and they're trying to help you in passing it along. Um, some of the diets are dangerous, some more than others, but some of them I'm gonna identify to you as being actually dangerous. Most of them can be if they're followed to an extreme. Some of them are expensive, like if you find a diet that says eat all organic food or you won't be healthy, that gets really expensive. And then again, some of them do have some healthful aspects and I wanna give them some credit, the ones that do. So let's jump right in with the paleo diet. I bet many of you have heard of the paleo diet. It also goes by the name of the Stone Age diet, the hunter-gatherer diet, or the caveman diet. Um, there's, you know, there's not just one paleo diet. A lot of people have jumped on this bandwagon and there's many books and many people promoting it. But the overall goal is to eat what early humans ate during the Paleolithic era. Now the Paleolithic era spanned from about 2.5 million years ago till about 10,000 BC with the advent of agriculture. So it was a long period of time, much longer than our modern era. And as you can imagine, people probably ate a lot of different things depending on where on earth they were and what they could get their hands on. But in general, people following or promoting the, the paleo diet say you should include foods that you can obtain by hunting and gathering. So lean meats, fish, fruits, veggies, nuts, and seeds. You should avoid foods that became common with agriculture, like grains, legumes, which is beans and, and lentils, um, dairy products, potatoes, refined sugar, salt, and highly processed foods. So you might be thinking there's some good here and there's some that seems a bit overly restrictive. And if you're thinking that, I agree with you. Like, you know, whole grains and legumes are really healthy. Um, but if you were to follow a paleo diet, a typical day might look like this. At breakfast, you'd have broiled salmon and cantaloupe, for example. At lunch, you'd have broiled lean pork loin and a salad with lots of veggies and maybe some walnuts and a lemon juice dressing. That sounds really good, actually, <laughs> that salad. Um, at dinner, you might have lean beef and steamed broccoli and another salad and maybe some strawberries for dessert. And for snacks, you might have an orange, carrot sticks, celery sticks. Um, what does anybody think of this menu? Does anyone, you know, want to, um, I don't know if you're able to unmute yourself or raise your hand. They can unmute if they would like. Okay. So I'd just be interested, if, you know, totally up to you, but if you have anything you want to say about this menu, I'd be interested in hearing it. Uh, Elaine says too much protein. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in particular, a lot of animal protein, huh? Yeah. What's a problem with all that animal protein? Um, wait, Elaine, you're muted. Oh, uh, there you are. there's a lot of fat. Isn't there a lot of fat in animal protein, um, cholesterol or all well, that? if it's lean animal protein, then there's not going to be a lot of fat. And it specifies oh, okay. lean here um, for, the, for the beef and the pork. True. But what else about the animal protein? Anything Kill, else? Like killing a lot of animals. Hmm. <laughs> A lot of animals are being sacrificed. 
And it's not good for our earth. It's not good for our environment to be funneling so many resources into growing livestock that we then eat. It's not sustainable for our planet. Um, and also a high animal protein intake, lean or not, is linked with a higher risk of colon cancer. So I agree with you, Elaine, about the problem with all that animal protein. Anything else anybody can identify about this menu? Not enough fiber? Um, well, it would depend on how much cantaloupe and veggies and fruit you had. But yeah, kind of with the lack of whole grains um, and the lack of legumes, it does make it challenging to get enough fiber. Mm. That is a good point. Um, anything else anybody can identify? How about it's expensive? Does that look expensive to you? Because of the salmon and the pork and the beef all in one day, um, you couldn't be on much of a budget, you know, a restricted budget if you're, you're trying to eat this way. Um, and also, I wonder how sustainable it is from a standpoint of um, how happy people are gonna be day in, day out with just strawberries or something like that for dessert, realistically. Um, okay. So let me move on and just give you some facts and concerns that I have about it, some of which you've identified. So let me um, change this view. Okay, so clinical trials have shown that people can have great success on a paleo diet. You can lose weight, improve blood sugar, blood pressure control, and triglycerides, which are fats in the bloodstream. Um, so it might for some people be a good short term program for doing those things or any one of those things that you need to do. But again, I'm concerned about the absence of whole grains and legumes, the expense and the sustainability. And by the way, also there are questions about the hypothesis. Archaeological data shows now that early humans going way back, even, even 30,000 years, may have likely have included wild grains even before they started growing them in fields so the whole hypothesis of the diet might not even be correct that people didn't eat those back then okay now i'm going to show you a, a, a this uh, uh, painting is what some people term paleo art there's actually a genre called paleo art this artist is heinrich harder he was born in 1858, and he painted tons of these paintings. A lot of them seem to be of landscapes and dinosaurs. He was um, an art professor at the Prussian Academy of Arts in Berlin. Um, and I love this one because it shows what things might have looked like. I mean, we have no images, real images going back, way back into the Paleolithic period. So it's fascinating to see what it might have looked like this creature is a giant armadillo and they did exist they were called glyptodonts and they're extinct now but you can imagine how much food it would have generated for people if they could catch it i just think it's fascinating to look at um and here's another paleo art um painting by harder um, and he, again, he did tons of dinosaurs, just beautiful and fascinating. Okay, let's move on to another diet. Another very popular diet is the keto diet, the ketogenic diet. Um, and this is a very low carb, high fat diet. And it, like the paleo diet, is popular because it does work in the short term. People have had good results with weight loss and blood sugar control. What you do if you're following a keto diet is you eat a lot of fat, 70 to 80% of calories from a whole variety of different high fat foods like high fat meat, bacon grease, cream, sour cream, mayonnaise, butter, avocados, and olive oil. And a lot of those fats are highly saturated, not good for heart health, as you might've noticed you would have a very low carb intake. Most sites and experts say 20 to 50 grams per day. Some go even lower, even lower than 20 grams, which is practically impossible to do. Um, the little bit of carb you have, you get from non-starchy vegetables and a very few lower carb fruits. 
You have no starches, no grains, no legumes, no starchy vegetables like potatoes or corn. What this does, if it's really followed, is it puts the body into a state called ketosis, where you burn fat for fuel instead of glucose. The brain, we've, we've evolved so that our brains can break down fat for fuel. It's an evolutionary mechanism for survival. Um, the truth is that most people that think they're following a keto diet are actually not. They're following some kind of a modified version that has more carbs, and so they may not really be going into ketosis, but they may lose weight, and that's probably a good thing. You don't need to be in ketosis. Um, problems with this diet is that there are nutrient gaps. You won't get enough of certain vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and fiber. And long-term adherence, as you can imagine, would be very difficult. I mean, it might be fun for a few days to be eating all that bacon grease, but you know, how long are you gonna go that way? <laughs> um, there are plenty of sites that offer all kinds of keto recipes and plenty of books and plenty of programs. And I'm putting this here as an example. Um, there's these things that you can find online called keto fat bomb recipes. Um, and they involve making these goodies that are almost entirely made of things like cream cheese, butter, heavy cream, sour cream, mascarpone cheese, which is like an Italian cream cheese, and coconut oil. Um, and I'm sure they're delicious. I mean, they look delicious. Um, they cannot be healthy. Instead of sugar, they generally have non-nutritive sweeteners like Swerve or Stevia or Aspartame or something. The site that I got this from um, is run by a lady that, you know, says loud and clear, these are super healthful. So it just goes to show you, you have to be very careful and skeptical of what you read online. These are not healthful. Now we have a, a question from Philomena. How do people lose weight with all that fat? Well, you know, anytime you cut carbs, we're getting a lot of our extra calories from carbs. So even with that high fat intake, you can still lose weight if the calories are below a certain level. So, you know, the fat is filling. So you might have a satisfying serving of bacon at three meals a day um, and some non-starchy vegetables and you're gonna lose weight, but it's not healthy. Um, you know, you're cutting out all that bread and all those potatoes and all the candy and everything. You're gonna lose weight, but that again, doesn't make it healthy. Um, and just, you know, nice painting for you, <laughs> another Van Gogh. Um, of a woman churning butter in 1881. Butter, again, being a staple of the keto diet. Let us move on to another diet called the Whole30 diet. I don't know if any of you have heard of this. Um, it's very popular. It's developed by a lady named Melissa Hartwig Urban and her now ex-husband. It's a strict diet but you only follow it for 30 days. You have no grains, dairy, soy, legumes, sugar, certain preservatives and artificial sweeteners because they claim that these are linked to hormonal imbalances, systemic inflammation and gut issues. Um, and they claim that if you get rid of all those, you'll have improved digestion, better skin health, better immune function, metabolism improved, better fitness, better mood and better self-esteem. Those are a lot of claims. Um, now it is true that for example, a high sugar intake is inflammatory and some people don't tolerate dairy or possibly beans very well, but um, not most people. Oh, let me go back. Um, not most people, but the saving grace here, it's only 30 days, hence the name Whole30 Diet. And then you're supposed to slowly add the foods back and see how your body responds to them. So if you're somebody that doesn't respond well to dairy, for example, you'll find it out and then you know not to eat it. So I don't see a lot of harm being done um, because you're doing it only for that limited amount of time and there's still plenty of foods you can eat. So here's Melissa Hartwig Urban, who developed the diet and is now, I'm sure, a very rich lady. And a look on Amazon will show you that there, she's got many cookbooks devoted to this regimen. 
there's whole 30 for the slow cooker and for weeknights and for social occasions and uh, the, the beginner's guide and many, many others. And this is true of a lot of these diets. They don't stop at one book. They continue on and on. Let's move on to Tom Brady's diet, which is more than a diet. He's got a book and he's got a website and he sells a lot of, on the website, you'll find a lot of supplements and clothes and even some very fancy things like foam rollers that are very advanced foam rollers for you know muscle stretching before or after your workout. Um, so he started this, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I believe around 2013. Not entirely sure of that date, um, but let's take a look. He's got many supplements that he wants you to take if you follow his regimen. Here's just one of them, a TB12 Focus. And it's got a lot of different um, like plant extracts in it. Let me go back a second. Um, you can get 90 caps for $48. So you can see that that would add up if you were to stay on it. And there's a lot of other supplements that he recommends you take. This one is supposed to promise you healthy cognitive function and mental clarity. But you can get the plant extracts and the vitamins from eating good, healthy foods. Okay, so the diet itself, the TB12 method or diet, wants you to have 80% organic fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, and legumes, all organic. Um, and then the other 20% of what you eat should be grass-fed, organic, lean meats, and wild-caught fish or seafood. Um, you should avoid or at least limit dairy, nightshades, which is a class of vegetables that includes tomatoes, potatoes and peppers and a few others. Um, you should avoid or limit most oils, foods that have soy, GMO products, or gluten. And you should strictly avoid added sugar, artificial sweeteners, trans fats, caffeine, MSG, alcohol, and iodized salt. Does anybody have any thoughts looking at this? Folks can go ahead and unmute yourselves if you like, or type in the chat. Yeah, I, I see um, <laughs> the way there are so many processed foods today, not that they're good for you, but an awful lot of foods have soy in them. So <laughs> that's tough to avoid. Um, and, and again, this is outrageously expensive. It's very expensive because of the emphasis on meat and wild caught fish and organic. It's very expensive. Uh, yeah. 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 Philomena had the same comment, expensive. Yeah. And the thing about soy, for most people, soy is an extremely healthful food. For mm. most people, oils, like good oils, like olive oil is really healthy. It's not a neutral. It's really healthy. So there's some misconceptions here. Um, even caffeine in moderation is okay. It's the moderation that's important. Um, but there's some good here. You know, let's give him credit that the fact that he's promoting fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, and legumes, those are good, healthy foods. Um, yeah, okay. I have a question. Yeah. Um, why, let me just, um, I'm looking forward again. Oh, uh, gosh. I never mind because I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> That's okay. Maybe it'll come to you because I'm not done with this diet. Okay. Here, here's his strict rules. And remember, I talked about arbitrary rules. Um, fruits should not be combined with other foods. So, like, that means, for example, oh, like my favorite, one of my favorite things to do is throw fruit into toss salad and have it with dinner. Can't do that. Um, couldn't even have fruit for dessert because you've just eaten other foods. No high protein foods with carb rich foods. So that would mean like, let's say you're having some nice brown rice, but you can't have it with your fish. So I'm envisioning, okay, I'll have my rice at two in the afternoon or I'll have my fish at six. I, I don't know how that would work. Um, and avoid drinking water with or around meals. These are strict rules. They're really arbitrary. There's no scientific evidence to back them up. So, 
Um, I, I can't really endorse this diet, even though there's some good to it. It's just not based on strong science. However, I did want to honor Tom Brady with a painting. And the best I could think of was Thomas Gainsborough's The Blue Boy. I bet you've all seen this painting at some time or another. It's um, thought to be Thomas Gainsborough's most famous painting. It's from 1770. And it's probably, although art historians are not sure, it's probably a young man named Jonathan Butal or Buttle, I've seen it written different ways, um, who was the son of a wealthy merchant. And they didn't really dress like this all the time back then. This is meant to be a historical painting even back then when Gainsborough painted it. It's absolutely beautiful, I think. Um, and it's thought to be, it's thought that in painting it, Gainsborough modeled it and was giving homage to Van Dyck, who was a Flemish painter who over a hundred years previously had painted this um, portrait of Charles II, who was a king in Britain at some point or other. Um, and, if, and if you look at their poses and their faces and everything, there is definitely similarity in these two paintings. Okay, moving on, let's talk about a really outrageous diet called the blood type diet. Um, has anybody heard of this? I don't know if you like, I don't, I can't see of all you, all of you, but this is another popular diet, it has tons of people that seem to follow it, um, created by a naturopathic physician named Peter Dadamo. Um, and his premise is simply that your blood type determines the foods you should eat and the exer type of exercise you should do. And as you probably remember, there's four blood types that we're all one of, type A, type B, type AB, and type O. You might not even know your blood type. You don't generally have to go around knowing that, but there it is. So he, I'm not even gonna read through all these. I'm not gonna even uh, um, distinguish it by reading these lists. And he's got many books about it. But for example, just as an example, you can see if you have type A blood, you should avoid meat. But if you have type O blood, you should eat lots of meat. Um, and so on. And there's different rules for weight loss, like, you know, looking at the type of AB blood for weight loss, you should avoid chicken, corn, buckwheat, and kidney beans. I, I would just be so interested in knowing how he came up with these. Like, did he roll a dice? Because it's that arbitrary. There are no studies that demonstrate benefit. The author has done no research. Yet, here's one of his main books. Um, eat right for your type, but why stop at that? You can buy a separate book for each blood type. You can buy eat right for your blood type. You can buy, uh, let me make that so I can see it. You can buy cook right for your blood type. You can buy live right for your blood type. You can buy aging, fight it with the blood type diet. Arthritis, you get the idea. Allergies, there's one for diabetes. The one that troubles me the most, um, and really, you know, this is just wrong, is the one that's fight your cancer with a blood type diet. Um, really? Because people who have cancer need to be following a good regimen, you know, taking care of their medical regimen. And yes, diet is extremely important um, for a cancer patient, but not this. Philomena wants to know, why do people, uh, why do you think people are drawn to this if there's no research to back it up? Um, so often people are looking for something different and they will go online and see really good reviews and, you know, really good anecdotal testimonies, or they know someone that they respect who will tell them how good it is. And not everybody knows enough to look and see was there good research supporting this. They assume because somebody's a doctor like this guy that, you know, he must know what he's talking about. And they're not, you know, to be fair to these diets, they're not all this bad. They're all, you know, like this is, this is one of the worst, but I'm including it because it's popular and it has a lot of followers. You'd be much better off on Tom Brady's diet, even though you'd go broke. <laughs> Just, okay. Um, I'm going to move on to the alkaline diet. 
Um, this is another very popular one. And there's a, it's like paleo. There's more than one of them. There's many different books and people promoting an alkaline eating plan. And some of them are dietitians. I found several authored by dietitians. Um, so the premise here is that you should avoid acid forming foods. Think back to pH that you learned about in chemistry. You know, at some point there's a pH scale and things can be acidic or alkaline. And acidic uh, forming foods supposedly lead to a metabolic imbalance. And those would be foods like meat, dairy, eggs, grain, and pro processed foods. Whereas you should choose alkaline forming foods because they, they don't lead to that metabolic imbalance, and that would be fruits, vegetables, and legumes. So I have no problem with promoting a lot of fruits and vegetables and legumes. I do that all the time. The diet does promote healthful foods. It's the premise that's all wrong. Our bodies tightly regulate our pH balance, otherwise we'd be very, very unwell. So again, bad premise, but kind of good foods. So not a lot of harm done that I can see. This one gave me a laugh, the grapefruit diet, because it's been around forever. I remember writing something about this when I was in graduate school, and that was a long time ago. There have been versions of the grapefruit diet since at least the 1930s. The idea here is that um, great, you should have grapefruit or grapefruit juice with every meal. You should eat protein-rich foods, and you should restrict carbs. So all that is really good. Uh, actually. Some versions, though, limit calories to as low as 800 calories per day, and that's pretty low. That's too low for many, most people. The claim is that grapefruit burns fat and that you will lose as much as 10 pounds in 12 days. Losing that much weight that fast isn't healthy, and it generally means a person's losing a lot of fluid and, and you know, losing their muscle mass. But the fact is, that grapefruit is nutritious, it's a good source of vitamin C and potassium and the B vitamin folate and fiber. And if it's red grapefruit, it's got great carotenoids, but grapefruit doesn't burn fat. So sorry about that. It's still a healthy food to eat and I love them. I bet some of you do too. And there's not a lot of grapefruit art out there, but I found this one. Um, by one Audrey Flack, Still Life with Grapefruits from 1954. I think it's really pretty. I'm not sure I would have ever known it was of grapefruits, but it's still really pretty. Let's move on to the raw food diet. This is one, some diets have more of an ideological bent to them. And, you know, the people that follow a raw food diet really tend to feel passionately about it. Hold uh, on one moment. I think we have a question from Mary Martin. Mary, I'm going to ask you yeah. to unmute. Hi, Mary. Hi, Judy. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Good I'm good. Thank you. Uh, it's a quick question on the grapefruit, um, the grapefruit, the grapefruit diet. Yeah. Why is it that if you have uh, are on any kind of cholesterol medicine, do you avoid grapefruit? Oh, yeah. Um, grapefruit does interfere with some medications, and it's most notably some, not all, but some of the statins. So there's a compound okay. in the grapefruit that interferes with the enzyme that breaks down the statins. When you have a medication in your system, you do want it to get broken down eventually. The grapefruit can interfere with that with, in particular, three of the statins and um, it, it, lobostatin and two of the others. So when you're prescribed those statins, your doctor and or your pharmacist should be telling you, don't have a lot of grapefruit or at least don't have it at the same time of day that you're having the statin. So that is why, I hope that answers it for you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, raw food diet, um, again, a a passionately held belief system by some people. The belief is um, that if you were eating, can I see that? If you were eating um, mostly or all food raw, that is ideal for health. And it's de defined as foods not being heated over something like 118 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can have fruits, veggies, nuts and seeds, raw grains and legumes, 
nut butters and nut milks like soy milk and even dried meats but raw and i was wondering gee that must be really hard to eat legumes raw can you imagine eating raw chickpeas but you can soak these things grains and legumes you can soak them and you can sprout them um, you can have cold pressed oils you can have fermented foods like kimchi and sauerkraut seaweed sprouts also raw eggs uh raw dairy you know like unheated dairy un you know pasteurized dairy um raw meat and raw fish now we know with those last ones they can be problematic because there's risk of contam bacterial contamination so a person doing that has to be really careful of the source they get these foods from um but they claim they believe that cooking and heating destroys nutrients and natural enzymes and it certainly is true that cooking at high heat does, um, destroys some of the vitamin C, for example, in a food. But the facts are that no scientific evidence has shown that raw food is best for health. Um, research shows that both cooked and raw foods have health benefits. We certainly should eat a lot of raw foods, but also cooked foods. High heat does cause enzymes to denature or to unravel, they're proteins. But enzymes get broken down in the acidic environment of our stomachs anyway. So we're not relying on getting enzymes from foods. Our bodies produce our own enzymes. And cooking, as I mentioned, destroys harmful compounds like bacteria. Let's move on to the starch solution. This is a high starch diet. This is the one when I said I only just found out about one of these diets literally a few weeks ago, this is the one that I hadn't heard of, the starch solution. It's actually, they're promoting a very high carbohydrate diet. I'm stunned actually. I mean, nutrition recommendations change and I know that's frustrating for people, but we've come a long way in recent years and I'm pretty confident that the, recommend, the broad recommendations now to have good sources of protein at every meal and to kind of be moderate with carbohydrate intake um, and to have generous amounts of good oils, I'm pretty confident those are good recommendations. Yet here's John McDougall and his wife, Mary, and by the way, John McDougall's an MD, recommending that we eat a lot of high starch foods, that it's better for health, that you'll lose weight and prevent and cure common diseases. So people following this eat a lot of white potatoes, squash, corn, rice, beans, lentils, and only have limited fruit um, and non-starchy vegetables. Um, the person that I talked to that told me about this was very happy with it. She's eating a lot of potatoes within one meal. That can't be healthy as far as I know. You're supposed to have no fats and oils, um, not even nuts or seeds or avocados or olive oil. Those are really healthy foods. Um, this, these authors, Dr. McDougall and his wife, offer a variety of different programs. Um, I imagine they're all vir virtual right now. Too bad for them because I looked online at some of these they're really expensive. So like if you're the participant, not just the spouse coming along the rock for the ride, um, you're paying six to over $7,000 for the 10 day program. It looks like a spa online. It looks really like an elegant, you know, it's got pools and you know, they're cooking for you, but that's a lot of money um, for a program that doesn't make sense to me scientifically. However, speaking of potatoes, here's Van Gogh, um, a still life with an earthen bowl and potatoes from 1885, just beautiful. But we know that for eating potatoes healthfully, they can certainly be part of our healthful diet. But, you know, a nice serving is a small potato, or if you're confronted with a really big potato, maybe considering cutting it in half, certainly not eating several of them. Okay. Now I want to move on into what I consider to be the dangerous territory. Um, any of those that I've talked about could be dangerous if you overdid it, like the keto diet. If you overdid it, it could be dangerous, but some of these are really dangerous from the get-go. 
Has anybody heard of the Bulletproof Diet? Um, this is out there. It's got a cult-like following. Um, it was developed by this guy, Dave Asprey, <clears throat> who was very overweight himself. Um, he had nothing to do with healthcare. He was a Silicon Valley investor and tech entrepreneur who claims that he spent two decades and more than a million dollars of his own money to do what he calls hacking his own biology. I think he coined the term biohacking, which he, he talks about as being the art of using technology to change the environment internally and the body externally. Um, that doesn't make any sense to me. I've read that statement a few times and I don't understand what he means. I guess he's just talking about changing what you eat to be more healthy. Um, but if you wanna call it biohacking, okay. So here's the rules of the diet. Um, it's built largely around this coffee. You have to start the day with your bulletproof coffee, which is, excuse me, coffee blended with grass-fed butter and either coconut oil or MCTs. MCTs stands for medium chain triglycerides and where they really should be used is in a medical setting. Like when people are fed intravenously, they're giving, given MCT oil because they can utilize it you know, easily. But he has you blending it into your coffee. Um, you have a lot of egg yolks. You have a lot of grass-fed meat fat and marrow, avocado oil, coconut oil, and grass-fed butter. So a lot of fats, mostly highly saturated. Um, no gluten, no sugar. Limit fruits to one to two servings per day. And lots of supplements that you're supposed to take. There, you know, I won't read it, but there's a long list of supplements that you buy. The claim is that you'll lose weight, have more energy, and become smarter. Who doesn't want to become smarter? Um, but the fact is, it's nutritionally inadequate. It involves a lot of supplements, so it's expensive, and it's not good to take all those supplements. And it's unappealing. Uh, that level of high, high saturated fat foods and that coffee blended with the oils um, to me sounds very unappealing and this is just a totally unhealthy diet. So that one gets a thumbs down. However, um, regarding the coffee, <laughs> um, the coffee part isn't so bad, just the coffee. Here's a beautiful Camille Pissarro painting of a peasant girl drinking her coffee. He was a, an impressionist, a French Danish impressionist. And this is just very beautiful painting. Okay, moving on to just the worst, just the worst. There really is a carnivore diet and it really does have a lot of devoted followers. Um, this is another one where there's a really important ideological bent to it. Um, if people rave about this, when I looked on Amazon, there's just pages of glowing reviews. Sean Baker was an orthopedic surgeon. He's an MD. He claims he eats four pounds of steak per day. And the review on Amazon calls this a revolutionary paradigm breaking nutritional strategy that takes contemporary dietary theory and dumps it on its head. And all I can say about that is that is true. So you might think Sean Baker is saying, okay, eat a lot of veggies and whole grains, but also have four pounds of meat per day. But that's actually not what he's saying. What he's saying is we should only eat high fat animal products. Um, we should have meat, poultry, fish, and dairy. So there is, there is some dairy involved there and we should drink water. You should have no vegetables, no fruits, no grains, no legumes, no nuts, and no seeds. Um, the claim is that meat contains all the nutrients the body needs. I'm just trying not to laugh, I'm sorry. Um, the fact is, that this diet is lacking in vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, fiber, you name it. You're only gonna get enough protein, way too much. There, are, there is no research, there's no randomized controlled studies, obviously. 
Um, and I mentioned that there was an ideological bent to this. Um, so Baker um, has adopted an extreme anti-vegan position. And I wanna read you a quote from him. He says, for the most part, what I would suggest is just ignore them. Don't engage with them individually. It's like talking to a cow. There's nothing you can say that will change their minds because they're mindless drones. They've been brainwashed to believe some really poor evidence in science about health for sure and about the environment as well. And he's been embraced by many on the far right. Um, he had his medical license revoked in 2017, not due to this diet, um, but due to some incompetence that he demonstrated in his practice. But again, I wanted to mention this diet just because it's interesting that it's out there, but also he does have a lot of followers. Um, it's just amazing to me. And I wanted to show you a painting. Um, so this is not what we think of when we think of Monet, but there it is. Many artists have done paintings of meat and this is a Monet from 1864. Okay, you might have wondered somewhere along the way, should I do a detox? And, you know, we, can, we all might wonder that because there's a lot of celebrities out there that talk about the, the detoxes they do. Sometimes these are called a cleanse. And a lot of influential people like Dr. Oz promote detox diets and cleanses. And a lot of the people that are health coaches you know, there's probably, there are undoubtedly some very good health coaches out there, but to become a health coach is a very short program. It can be done in a matter of months. They don't have a lot of scientific training and I can't help but have noticed that a lot of them promote these detox regimens. Um, and it's unfortunate because they can be really dangerous. I don't know why this keeps going back, but here we go. So let's take a look. There's a lot of them out there. These are some of the books. They're very popular. Um, what, they, what the claims are is that if you do a detox, you will have rapid weight loss, you will remove toxins, you'll have increased energy, and you'll reduce the effects of aging. Um, most of them are regimens that include not only a special diet, but also colon hydrotherapy um, and diet, a lot of dietary supplements. Here's a couple of them. It all kind of started, as far as I know, at about 1976 when Stanley Burroughs published The Master Cleanse. And there still are versions of The Master Cleanse out there. It's been taken over from Stanley Burroughs by some, by some other people that he's worked with, but they're still out there. And the general idea with The Master Cleanse, as far as I can tell, is that you have six to 12 glasses of this lemonade every day, um, it involves an ounce of fresh squeezed lemon or lime juice, an ounce of organic maple syrup, some cayenne pepper, some water, and you're drinking that, a lot of that over the course of the day. And you also get a cup of herbal laxative tea before bed. Um, nothing else to eat. And you do this every day for a minimum of 10 days. So, wow. Um, that, that you just are not gonna meet your nutrient needs with that, clearly. Here's another one, the pound a day uh, Martha's Vineyard diet detox and plan for a lifetime of healthy eating by a couple people. Um, you have this berry drink, herbal teas and vegetable juice every two hours for 21 days. And that's it, except for a bunch of probiotics, digestive enzymes, and herbal cleanse of some sort at bedtime. You also have to do these colon cleanses and coffee enemas once a week, and that's just what it sounds like. So the fact is, um, there's no clinical guidelines. There's no randomized controlled trials. Um, so people can make up their own cleanses and detoxes and sell them. They're expensive because often they sell a lot of supplements and you have to buy the beverages to do what they're telling you to do. And you know, the, the, those animals are expensive. 
Um, there, it's not sustainable. You couldn't continue to follow that or you'd become malnourished. It's obviously very restrictive. Um, they don't meet nutritional requirements. Uh, people, um, side effects that occur are fatigue, poor immune function, constipation, gallstones, and electrolyte abnormalities. And there's no proven benefit for removal of toxins or improved health. So, you know, there are toxins in our environment, and I'm very concerned about the toxins in our environment. It's just that doing this is not the way to try to get rid of them. Um, as Leonardo da Vinci knew, the human body is an amazing, wonderful machine, and we have the real detox. At every moment of every day, our GI tract, our kidneys, and our lungs perform the detox that we need. So why are there so many diets? As I think Philomena asked, or somebody asked, I'm sorry. Um, so the American diet is very high in highly processed foods and for most people, many people, way too high in carbs. So we have health issues, we have weight issues, and there's this desire for quick, easy, permanent weight loss and better health. So that's why there's a demand, there's a market for these diets. But you have to remember, there's often a hook. Um, so for example, with the paleo diet, the hook is that you're going to eat like our distant ancestors. And that sounds very appealing to many people, whether it's accurate or appropriate, or not. Um, remember also that weight loss doesn't necessarily equal health. You can lose a lot of weight by doing one of those detoxes, but you're not going to be healthy from it. And also remember that if it's not a sustainable plan, the pounds can come right back anyway. So some questions to ask if you're thinking of doing one of these or any diet are does it restrict healthful foods? Like for example, legumes and fruit. You shouldn't give those up unless you have to for some medical reason. Do the benefits promised seem too good to be true? Like, like for example, effortless weight loss. Weight loss isn't generally effortless <laughs> or is it going to cure all of your ailments? It's doubtful. More questions. Is there good research supporting this diet? Or do they rely on a bunch of anecdotes and personal testimonies? Um, you know, they can generally find someone to say something good about it, several people in fact, but that's not enough. It's better if there's good research. And also it's good to ask what are the credentials of the people promoting the diet? But as we've already seen, it's not foolproof because there are MDs and PhDs and all kinds of people out there promoting diets, you know, for their own benefit. Which leads to my next question. I really would like to know is somebody profiting greatly from this diet? If somebody's profiting greatly, I don't think that's a good sign. Sometimes, as I mentioned in the beginning, there, and I've kind, I hope I've imparted to you throughout, there is benefit to these diets, to some of them. Sometimes people really do want and need a jump start. They know they want to get into a healthier way of eating. And so sometimes a jump start, you know, following a plan is the way to go. So if you pick one of the healthier diets out there, um, okay, you might need that. And some people also like the structure that a, a book or a plan might provide. Um, and so, you know, if you look at the paleo diet, the whole 30 diet, the alkaline diet, they do have a lot of vegetables. So those might be for some people a way to temporarily diet, you know, but try to build good habits that you can stick with long term. There's a common message out there that says diets don't work. And you wanna know who's usually saying that as best as I can tell? It's dietitians and other healthcare providers. And I get where that is coming from because what they mean is a lot of these extreme diets don't work. But there are some really great eating patterns out there and sometimes we refer to them as diets. 
So like the Mediterranean diet is a really healthful way of eating. The DASH diet, which is very similar to the Mediterranean diet, is a really healthful way of eating. Vegetarian diet, if it's done right, is a really healthful way of eating, as is pescatarian, which is like vegetarian with fish, you know, and seafood. And there's some others, but there's healthy eating patterns out there. So diets can work. It's just semantics, how we use the term diet. So also what works is to, you know, this is broadly speaking, to love yourself and take care of yourself. And that involves eating good, healthful foods to nourish your body and soul, getting regular physical activity, getting adequate rest and sleep, and having relaxable, enjoyable activities that you love, um, socializing in any way that you can these days. These are all ways of taking care of yourself. We do have a question from Philomena. Sure. How, do you, how do you feel about a vegan diet? Okay, so um, I'm totally in favor of it if it's done carefully and right. It can be unhealthful if a person, you know, a vegan diet, for anyone that doesn't know, eliminates all animal products. So there's no dairy and there's no eggs. And some people even take it so strictly that they won't even have, for example, honey, because honey comes from the bee. Um, and they won't wear leather. And, you know, again, it gets into ideology. But if it's done right, it certainly can be healthful and very, you know, good for the planet. But a person eating a vegan diet needs to be careful to, I think, have legumes. It's very hard to get enough protein if you're vegan and you're not having good, you know, beans and lentils um, and, and so on. Uh, we have a question from Elaine. Do you recommend intermittent fasting or is? Yeah, um, I, yeah, you know, I was going to include that and I knew I was going to go over time and I, I'd like to include that in another class. But yes, it, if it's done right, intermittent fasting being, um, you know, either on certain days of the week, limiting your caloric intake, or also people take that to mean for several, many hours a day, you don't eat. Um, and if it's done right, and we can talk about that in another class, I'll, I'll work that into another class, if, you know, um, for sure. Yeah. Great. Um, I actually have a question. Um, yeah. Have you read or heard of Gene Eating, the Science of Obesity and the Truth About Dieting by um, Giles Yao, Y-E-O? Is it, um, gene, it came, gene Editing? Gene Eating. So mm -hmm. it came out last year. Can you see my screen? I can. Yeah. Okay. So that's the book. It came out last year. It's, it's kind of an anti-dieting book. Mm -hmm. And uh, I haven't read it yet, but I'm, it's on my to-be-read list. You know, I feel like maybe I've heard of it, but no, I haven't read it and I really don't know anything about it. Okay. Well, part of the premise, I guess, is um, the way our genetic makeup influences our relationship with food. So, as, you, you know, you have that doctor with the, the, the blood, blood type. Yeah. And so that kind of made me think of this. Um, but do you think there's any, any science or backing to this? Well, there could be more likely than with the blood type diet. It, it could be that our genetic composition um, affects our, our behaviors and our kind of addictive behaviors. Maybe, maybe some people have an easier time of it, just saying no to sugary foods. Um, I don't know if, you know, if our genes are going to say you need a higher protein intake, you know, different people are different. I don't know, but there may be some genetic components. I'd like to get a look at the book. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. Of course. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any, any other questions for Judy? Look. I appreciate so much that you're all here and I thank you. And I just want to look up the date of the next class. I don't have that oh, yeah. right in my head. Um, Let's see. November. So it'd be November 14th. Um, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're right. And that's also, again, a Saturday. And um, we're going to be covering healthy holiday eating. Um, just how to get through this period of the holidays, enjoying the food, 
having some treats, but trying to do it healthfully. I talk about this every year, so I know some of you in some form or another have been to this class, but but I, I feel like it's good to hear it. <laughs> it's a, you know, ho holidays can be challenging, although the challenges are different this year. But um, anyway, I really thank you all for coming. This was fun to talk to you about this. Well, thank you, Judy. We're getting a couple of thank yous in the chat. Thank you. Yes, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording.